Welcome everyone back to our afternoon service. I do appreciate you being here again. This afternoon our lesson is not going to be exactly from this morning, but it will tie in somewhat at least. We're going to talk this afternoon about there are just some things that money can't buy. I suppose in all modern day societies that economy is based upon a monetary system. An ex exception to this would be bartering, trading various goods or objects or services uh, that will be considered of equal value. There is evidence in the scripture that ancient nations had some type of monetary system. The words money, silver, and price are translated from the same Hebrew word, kiself. The Old Testament is trans is, this is translated 112 times as money, 287 times as silver, and three times as price. It's first used in the 13th chapter of Genesis as silver. In Genesis 13, 2, we can read, And Abram was very rich with cattle in silver and in gold. And that word that we just mentioned is, would relate to the English word silver in this particular passage. So as we look at the lesson this afternoon, we're going to look at some things that just money can't simply buy us. And today we live, though, in a world where everything seems to be governed by money. And people want to put a price on, on everything. No matter what it is, where you are, people want to put a price on that. There are those who have a lot of money who are trying to buy something they want and they'll say every man has his price. If they want something someone else has, they'll say every man has his price. Well, there are some things that we might in our own minds consider priceless. Although it might not literally be priceless, it may be a family heirloom, something of sentimental value that we'll never get rid of. And no matter how much money a person offers us, those things will not be bought. But we live in that kind of system where we use money for most everything. But there are some things that money can't buy. When Philip, the gospel preacher, preached in the city of Samaria, several of his citizens had obeyed the gospel. Among them was a man named Simon. He was called a sorcerer. He previously practiced witchcraft. And in Acts chapter 8, verses 5 through 13... We find that Peter and John had come from Jerusalem so that the new converts might receive the Holy Spirit. We know that Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached to them Jesus. And of those who believed and heard, it says they were baptized. And among those was the man called Simon the sorcerer. And Peter and John came down to lay hands upon these people. And when Simon had been baptized... And then he saw that when Peter and John came that through the laying on of the apostles' hands that a gift of the Holy Spirit was given to these people. He wanted that power. And in verses 18 and 19, he offered Peter and John money, saying, Give me also this power that upon whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Spirit. He didn't just ask Peter and John for this power so he could lay hands on people they might receive the Holy Spirit. But he wanted the same power the apostles had and he wanted that power because he, can knew, he knew he could use that to make money. He was in his own mind using something that was holy, something that was spiritual and he was trying to turn it into something that was material for monetary gain. And we can read in this particular passage that Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee. Because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right with God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps a thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive thou art in a gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. So Peter had to address this. He couldn't let that slide. Because here's a man who for dishonest gain was trying to get the gift of the Holy Spirit 
and use it for ill will rather than for the purpose which the apostles were doing and that was to provide gifts to people as the gospel system had just begun. They did not have the gospel in written form and it was through the apostles and the prophets and the laying on of the apostles' hands on other people to give them the gifts, to give different ones gifts so that the gospel may be spread. The whole purpose of this and the whole purpose of what the Holy Spirit did through these people in the first century was to spread the borders of the kingdom since they didn't have it written down like we have it. Now we have it written down today in, in the written form. We have the Bible, the book that we can read and study. And the reason they were given those miraculous gifts in the first century is because they didn't have something like we have today. And I know some people, and I'm going to get off the subject a little bit, I know some people still believe in the laying of hands and all kind of gifts of the Spirit. But 1 Corinthians 13 said those gifts were going to end in the first century. And they were going to end for a reason because after the will of God was completed, there was no more need for the laying on of the apostles' hands or the gift of the Holy Spirit or miraculous gifts because they had enough letters and enough things written to them that they could read and they could study it, just like we can today. But look at the attitude that Simon had at this particular point. He did it for dishonest gain or wanted it for dishonest gain. Then we have in the congregation of Jerusalem a man and his wife called Ananias and Sapphira who lied about money that they were giving. See, money can't buy everything. And Ananias and Sapphira had seen that there were other brethren who were giving lands and houses and other things to people and people were rejoicing that the others had given so much. So what did Ananias and Sapphira do? They go out and sell a piece of property and they get the money for it. Nothing wrong with that. They come and lay the money at the apostles' feet. There's nothing wrong with that. But what they did, they lied about the amount of money they were giving. They implied that every dime that came from the sale of that property was given to the apostles. They kept back part of it, but they wanted the name recognition and they wanted a pat on the back just like others had been getting because they gave lands and money and houses and so for dishonest reasons, they lied. And we see where it got them. At separate times, Peter called them in and told them, well, this is, using John's words, this is it for you. <laughs> You're not going to be here any longer. They dropped dead right in front of Peter. Because he said, you have not lied to men, but you've lied to God. Nothing wrong with what they had to begin with. They didn't have to sell the land. There's nothing wrong when they sold it and giving the money to the apostles. And they could have even said, well, here's part of that money. We need the rest for A, B, and C, whatever. Would that have been honest? Absolutely. But they wanted to mislead the apostles into thinking that everything that they brought to them was the total sale of the price of the land. They lied. And that's why they were told that they were going to die for their sin because of the lie they told. You've not lied to men, but you've lied to God. They misrepresented what they had. And we also see that money cannot change the spiritual state of a person after they've departed this life. You know, there are those who believe, well, you can pay a little bit of money and that'll... That'll help you family members that died. In the old Catholic system, there's what they say is a place called purgatory. And purgatory is a place where those have died who they weren't bad enough for hell, but they're not good enough for heaven. So they go to this place that is somewhat a place of punishment. And after a while, you can pay some money and basically get them out so they can go to heaven. Folks, there's nothing in the Bible that teaches that. There's no doctrine in the Bible that teaches purgatory. The Bible does not nor has ever revealed a place called purgatory. But there is a place called the Hadean realm, the place of the dead where they're retained into judgment. And the scriptures point out how a person dies spiritually and how they're going to be judged on the day of judgment. In Hebrews 9.27, as it is appointed unto men once to die, 
and after this the judgment. All of us are going to eventually die unless the Lord comes again before that time and then we're going to face the judgment. Stand before God in, in judgment and be judged by how we lived and what we've done here upon this earth, including how we use our money and how honest or dishonest we are with that money. So we need to remember that God blesses us with things. We have to use it wisely. We also have to be honest in the way we do our, our dealings with man and even with God when it comes to money. But then next, there are those in this world who will do just almost anything for money. Matter of fact, you name the price on some people, they'll do whatever you ask them to do. We see a lot of murders for hire. Why would someone receive money to go take another person's life? Because all they're thinking about is money. Oh, you give me that much money? Oh, I'll do it. I'd have probably done it for less, but thank you. I'll do it for this. That's the attitude people have. They think you can do anything at all with money, not realizing that you don't do things for ill-gotten gain. Judas Iscariot betrayed the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. In Matthew 26, 47 through 56, we're not going to read that. It's found in Matthew 26, verses 47 through 56. He betrayed the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. And then his guilt was so great afterward that he took the money back and then he went out and hung himself. He committed suicide because he was so guilty for what he had done for the Lord or to the Lord. He knew what he had done was wrong. He knew before he did it it was wrong. He knew when he did it was wrong. And he knew after he did it was wrong. Did that mean he needed to commit suicide? No. He could have repented. Peter betrayed the Lord, or denied the Lord rather, and he repented, and he went on through life to be a great apostle. Judas could have done the same thing. However, he chose, I would say, the coward's way out. Rather than face up to what he had done, he decided to end his life. Folks, that happens all the time. If you work in any kind of line of work dealing with the public, you'll see that. And especially the line of work I deal with, we see that too often. I, I don't even like seeing that, but we're called upon to go to those type of scenes and deal with some of that and see what people do to themselves because either despair or depression or whatever it is. And that's what happened with Judas. He was in despair in his own mind because he betrayed the Lord over money. Money didn't buy him happiness. It caused him to make a rash decision and end his life. In Matthew 27, 3 through 5, it says, And Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and elder, saying, I have sinned that I have betrayed innocent blood. And they said, What is it to us? See thou to it. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Now this passage, it also says he repented himself. It didn't mean he repented of his sins. He regretted what he did. He regretted the decision he made. He still went out and hung himself. That's not repentance. So he was still wrong in what he did. Then we find an a instance of righteous indignation where Jesus Christ, the Son of God, went into the temple and was angry at the money changers for conducting their business in the house of God. And not only were they conducting business in the house of God, they were being dishonest in what they were doing. And the passage points it out in Matthew 21, verses 12 and 13, where it says, And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all of them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written... My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. That's why I said they were dishonest. Not only were they buying and selling and trading goods in the temple, but they were doing it in a dishonest manner because he said you've made it a den of thieves. They were stealing from people in the way they're doing it. And what, at least part of what I've read before is in their weights and measures and how they were being dishonest with their scales when they were making those exchanges. But then next, we need to understand that there are some things more valuable than money and material possessions. 
The story of the rich man and Lazarus is a classic example of this truth. Our salvation is a lot more important than riches. In Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31, we learn about a rich man who leaves this life in a spiritually lost state while the poor beggar Lazarus passes from this life to a saved state. In Luke 16, verse 19, we can begin reading this, and it says there is a, was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and he fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed from the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us which would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, Father, therefore that thou would send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they come to this place of torment. And Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but one, if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they will not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Here you have a man that, as the Bible puts it in the King James Version, that he fared sumptuously every day. No need of want. Everything in his fingertips, anything he wanted to buy, he could buy. Then you had poor old Lazarus that was laid outside of his, this rich man's gate, sick physically and full of sores. So bad to the point that even the dogs came and licked his sores and ultimately died. What did that rich man do for Lazarus while he laid at his gate? Did he not know he was there? Absolutely, he knew he was there. There's no question about that. He just didn't care for Lazarus. He didn't care to take care of Lazarus' needs. He didn't care for the fact that he was sick, he was hungry, and he let a man lie in front of his house and die. But in all indications from the life of Lazarus, he went into Abraham's bosom, which tells me that he was a faithful Jew. He followed the law of Moses, as he should. And he was saved as a result of it. But the rich man went into torment. He had all this money, and yet his money couldn't save him. It's sad that people get into that kind of state and that they won't think enough of what God has done for them to be thankful for it and live a Christian life. I mentioned this passage this morning, and it's worth repeating in Matthew 16, 26. What is a profit of man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And what shall it give in exchange for a soul? What is it profit us if we gain all the things of this world? All the money, all the fame, all the fun, and we lose our soul. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount, verses 19 through 21, He said, Lay not of yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and thieves break through and steal. But lay up yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and thieves do not break through or steal. Notice verse 21. He said, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where is our heart? Where do we make our treasure? In our heart. Is it on this world? Things that moth and rust corrupts? You think about when he talks about moth or moths. Now, you don't see people using mothballs very often anymore. You don't hear a lot about moths getting in your clothes and eating them up, but there was a time that it happened. A lot more frequently it does now. 
But even now, though, our clothes, after a while, they wear out, start getting holes in them. I know that's the fashion in a lot of places, but typically you don't want holes in your clothes. When I was growing up, if you had a hole in the clothes, either had to be sewn up, patched up, or discarded, or used for play clothes. That's mostly what it was, used for play clothes at that time. You didn't go out with holes in your jeans. I meant that you had some wore out jeans and mama wouldn't let me in public with some wore out jeans that had holes in them. I either got patches put on them or I got new jeans. Nowadays they're ripped and torn and that's the fashion. And that is a fashion today. But we can't take those things to heaven with us and that's the point. Money can buy us those things, but we can't put our faith and trust in money. We can't take that with us. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 9, it tells us, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we'll carry nothing out of it. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. But they that will be rich will fall on the temptation and the snare and many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in, in perdition and destruction. Paul laid it out very plainly to Timothy. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We need to be content with the things we have. There's not a person in here that doesn't see something and say, Oh, I'd, I'd like to have that. Partly is human nature. There's a lot of things all of us would like to have that very likely most of us will never get. It may be some fancy car. It may be some big house. It may be going to some exotic country or exotic land. We can wish. But when we start putting all of that energy into wishing and hoping and wanting for those things that takes us away from our service to God and our life as a Christian then we're coveting things that we can't have and the Bible condemns covetousness he said we need to be content with our food and our raiment so food and clothes be content with that anything else we have remember it's blessings from God and all of us blessings from God Two of the apostles, Peter and John, were approached to the temple in the hour of, prayer, of our prayer at the gate called Beautiful. And there was a beggar there who had been born lame. And when Peter and John passed by, he asked them for some money. Now we have people that we see standing on the corners here that they ask for money. But here's what Peter and John said unto him. Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. But such as I give thee, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength. And leaping up, he stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Found in verses 6 through 8. Notice the man was asking for money. He was just begging. Peter said, well, I don't have any money. Don't have any silver or gold, but I'm going to give you something better. Do you think that man would have rather had just a minor amount of change to lay there crippled for the rest of his life and continuing to beg for money and, and not being able to get up and walk and enjoy things, other things in this life? Or do you think that he was happy that Peter healed him of his disease he had or his crippleness, whatever was causing it? It did say that he, he received strength in his feet and his ankle bones. And not only did he stand up, he leaping stood up and walked. And it says, walking and leaping, he praised God in the temple. That man was happy, wasn't he? He didn't get what he wanted. He wanted money to continue to beg and to supply whatever minor amounts of money that was given to them just to survive. Now he was healed where he could not only walk, but he could earn a living. Peter gave him a better gift than anything else could have been given to him in a monetary way. But we also need to understand that our reputation should be more valuable than great riches. In Proverbs 22, verse 1, it says, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. 
and loving favor than silver and gold. Our good name should be more than just wanting money. We have a reputation. We have integrity. I was talking to one of my guys I worked with a while back, and we were talking about just various things that people do and how just in life people in general will sometimes cut corners just to get by and maybe make a little extra money, or they may fudge their time sheet a little bit, not do something exactly honest. He said, I have integrity. I'm not going to do something dishonest like that. And just think about it. A lot of people, or most people, I would say, are like that. But there's some who have no integrity. And with that lack of integrity, they lose a reputation eventually when it's found out and they're doing things they shouldn't. Look at people who work for businesses. They're given credit cards from the business. And how they may use that credit card for their own personal gain. I've seen that happen and even heard of an account recently where that's happened. Where an employee did that and... Now they're facing the consequences. How often in this world does that happen? Probably more than we realize. But they're willing to give up their reputation, their integrity, their honesty for some money. Finally, we're responsible under our Heavenly Father on how we use our money. First century Christians who lived as criminals before obeying the gospel were exhorted by Paul in Ephesians 5, uh, 4.28 let him that stole steal no more. Rather, let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may give to him that needeth. Notice there are several things in this small little verse that we can look at and that helps us in this. He said, if you're a thief or were a thief, you become a Christian now, don't do any more stealing. You don't steal anymore. You work with your hands. You earn a living. But there's more to it. He even tells it by earning a living. What are you going to do with the money? He said, give it to the poor. doesn't mean we give every dime we make to the poor because we have our bills. We have to buy our groceries. We have to sustain our life. But as Galatians 6.10 tells us, as we therefore have opportunity, let us do good to all men, especially those of the household of faith. That's not always money, folks. It could be helping them in other ways, but it could include money. So the things that we've been blessed with, we should try to help others who are less fortunate than us. Able-bodied men are responsible for providing for their families. You look at men in the world today. I mean, there are a lot of women that work, and I know some that their husbands sit at home, let the wife earn the money. They don't have a job. They don't do anything. And that's sad. Why? Number of reasons. Number one, the man's the head of the house, and it's the, the God-given responsibility of the man to provide for the family. First Timothy 5, 8 says, If any provide not for his own, especially those of his own house, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. He's worse than an unbeliever. A person who even calls himself a Christian who is not willing to get up and have the gumption to get up and to go out and work for his family is worse than an infidel. Folks, God gave us that command. Men, we have the responsibility to take care of our families. It seems like now you see more and more stay-at-home daddies, stay-at-home men. They just don't want to work. I'm not saying that's all the time, but that does happen. And we have that responsibility to work and provide for our families. But we live in a topsy-turvy world today where... <laughs> Black is white and white is black and things are changed all around and the society now has done that and it's getting worse, unfortunately. We also are to take care of our financial obligations. In Romans 13, 8, the Bible teaches us, Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Now in the context, this verse is emphasizing paying our taxes, showing honor to whom honor is due, custom to whom custom is due. Nevertheless, the principle could have a wider application. If we buy something on an installment plan, we should, if at all possible, pay those obligations when they're due. We should pay all of our financial obligations. It's not like we're going to go out and buy a car and put it on credit and then see how long we can go without somebody coming and getting it from us. 
because we have no desire, no inclination to ever pay any of that back. Folks, there are a lot of people in the world like that today. They go buy something and then they won't fulfill their obligation and know they won't fulfill it. Sometimes people lose their jobs and they, they come on hard times and that's a little different situation and there are times that people can call a financial institution, make some type of arrangement. We're not talking about things like that, but they still have the responsibility to pay. We're not discounting it. But there are those in this world who will cheat people every opportunity they can. Unfortunately, it seems like that's getting worse. You and I should also, in the final point, give upon the first day of the week to the church so the church can meet the obligations to reach out to the lost with the gospel, to help support the spreading of the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 16, 2, it says, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Paul told the Corinthians, You give as you've been prospered. Upon the first day of every week, you give so there won't be any gatherings when I come. He had already told them he's coming to gather money to help poor needy saints. And he didn't want to get to Corinth and them scrounge around and just find something to throw in. Okay, here, Paul, here, we, we got a little bit we can give you. He's setting forth a principle on giving on the first day of the week for Christians. And as we did this morning, we took up a collection. And that collection is to help spread the gospel, is to help the church here, is to help the poor and the needy. Many things are used by that money that's collected. And we have to use it wisely. We can't just, every time somebody says, I need money, oh, how much you need? Let's just shell you out some money. People do have some obligations themselves, but we are here in the church to use that money for God's glory, where that is helping the poor, where that is helping the widows and the orphans, whether it is in spreading the borders of the kingdom and the gospel and helping financially those who are preaching the gospel and those missionaries overseas, or actually using that money to send someone overseas. There's a lot of ways the money can be used, but it starts with our obligation as individual Christians to give as we've been prospered. Not to have the plate come around, well, I got $5 this week I'll throw in there. Were you prospered more than that? Then we give more. Give not grudgingly or of necessity, for God love the cheerful giver, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. And we need to think about that when we are planning on giving. And folks, our giving should be planned. It's not a last minute thing on what I can find in my wallet. Well, I've only got a dollar this week, I'll throw it in there. You work a job, you earn a living, give back to God as you've been prospered. The Old Testament system, the tithe was 10%. And a lot of churches use that. Well, I'll give my tithe this week of 10%. Do you realize that after the Jew gave everything, not only in their tithes, but their offerings, and when they had their sacrifices, that their contribution was probably a third of what they had? Everybody said, well, I give a tenth, it's a tithe. We don't tithe in the New Testament anymore, folks. There are no tithings in the New Testament. The Bible says give as you've been prospered. And we need to do so lovingly and cheerfully because not only should we want to give to God, we should be happy to give to God because we know that that money is being used to the betterment of the kingdom of God, not only in this area, but in many times all over the world. And it's something that we need to do and we need to think about. In reaching out to our fellow man with the gospel of Christ, those who are poor of earthly possessions are generally more receptive to the gospel than the wealthy. It's not to say that the wealthy don't, but generally those who are just your everyday normal person that doesn't have a whole lot of riches, they'll read and study the Bible and want to do something right. Again, it's not to say the rich won't, but generally speaking, they're more concerned with their riches. They're more concerned with what they can get out of this life, and they're not too much concerned with the life hereafter. So as we close, what are we going to do with our money? You know, money can't buy everything. We can't take it with us. 
I've heard story after story of people who, when they died prior to their death, say, put all my money in my casket. I'm going to take it to God. I'm going to give it to God, and he's going to give me heaven. It doesn't work that way either, folks. I know this was probably just a joke, but it's a story I heard years ago that an old man made a lot of money, he was very wealthy, and he told his wife when he died, he said, I'm sorry, but I want all of my money put in my casket with me. I'm not going to leave you anything, but I want all my money put in my casket. So when I get stand in front of God, I can bribe God because I know I haven't lived right. So someone asked the wife, well, what are you going to do? Because her husband died. She said, I put a check in his pocket in the casket. <laughs> Didn't leave all his cash in there. He was wanting the cash put in the, in the casket. She said, I just wrote a check out and stuck it in his pocket, and he can give that to God. Well, if that was a true story, I was probably pretty smart because she still had the money with her. And it doesn't matter if she put a check in or all the cash. You can't take money to heaven or to hell either one. And most of the time who trust in all their money, or not most of the time, all the time when people trust in their money more than they do God, they're going to lose their soul in hell. So their money's not going to do anything for them. Money cannot buy everything. We know that living a Christian life can help us in our lives to, as we are faithful, to have a home in heaven one day. And one day we will have that home in heaven if we so live and do God's will and put our trust in Him and not in this world or not in the goods of this world. As a child of God, if you're not living the life that you should be living, it may have something to do with money. It may not. It may just be simply your life is not right with God. We urge you to come back and repent of your sins. Change your life in repentance. Confess your sins and pray for the forgiveness of them. Just as we find in Acts chapter 8 that was done with Simon the sorcerer because he said to Peter, pray for me that none of these things will happen to me. He was penitent. He changed after realizing his error. And we don't have any other indication otherwise that he lived an unfaithful life. And we hope and pray that Simon lived a faithful life that he'll be in heaven one day. And so can you if you live a faithful life. If you're not a Christian, if you obey the gospel through your faith, repentance, confession, and baptism into Christ, to be added to the church which Jesus built in the first century and live a faithful life and walk in the light as he is in the light, to enjoy that fellowship and to enjoy heaven one day as your home. If you are subject in any way, come right now. Why together we stand and why we sing.